Did Janis Joplin bring tattoos to the mainstream? How deep did her love of the blues really go? And did the severe bullying she faced in her hometown ultimately lead to her untimely death? Keep watching to learn the truth. Just a few days before her shocking death in 1970, Janis Joplin spent time in the studio for what would become a very unexpected final recording, a performance of Happy Birthday for none other than the Beatles' John Lennon. Accompanied by Full Tilt Boogie Band, Joplin's rendition was one of several birthday greetings that were being mailed to Lennon in England. Tragically, by the time Lennon received the recording, he had already learned of Joplin's death. Making the recording even more bittersweet is the fact that Joplin also included a spontaneous rendition of the classic song Happy Trails to You, a final farewell from one great to another. Though her death was caused by a heroin overdose, Janis Joplin had also gained a reputation for hard drinking. Her drink of choice? Southern Comfort. You could argue that no other brand better capitalized on the whiskey-fueled blues of the Deep South to which Joplin gravitated. As reporter after reporter mentioned Joplin's drink of choice in features and interviews with the celebrated singer, she became a poster child for the spirits. She told Mike John in 1968, I tell all the performers I meet to drink Southern Comfort because it preserves their voices. It's just an excuse for my drinking. In Love Janice, Joplin's sister Laura said that Janice was inspired to reach out to Southern Comfort for a sponsorship deal. According to Laura, Janice said, I had the chick in my manager's office photostat every clipping that ever had me mentioning Southern Comfort, and I sent them to the company, and they sent me a whole lot of money. How could anybody in their right mind want me for their image? Oh man, that was the best hustle I ever pulled. Can you imagine getting paid for passing out for two years? All of that talk about you and Southern Comfort, what's that all about? It's really good when you're going to go on stage. It gives you that, when, you, when you're right when you're going on, you need that kick. Janice reportedly used Southern Comfort's money to buy her iconic Russian three-quarter length Lynx coat, valued at $5,000. Paired with a matching hat, these became the signature look the singer wore at the slightest threat of cold weather. Janis Joplin nursed a lifelong affection for the blues singer Bessie Smith, who died tragically in a car accident in 1937 and lay for more than 30 years in an unmarked grave. At the time of her death, the blues singer's family couldn't scrape together enough money for a more fitting monument at the Mount Lawn Cemetery. But in August of 1970, Joplin and Juanita Green, a registered nurse from Pennsylvania, footed the bill to have a proper tombstone erected at the grave of the Empress of the Blues. Roughly 50 fans attended the tombstone placement ceremony, where the slab featuring the inscription, the greatest blues singer in the world will never stop singing, enjoyed permanent placement. While Joplin never met Smith personally, the similarities between the two performers proved uncanny. Linda Godfrey, Joplin's friend and roommate, said in Love Janice that she believed Joplin to be the reincarnation of Smith, from her foul mouth to her penchant for eccentric clothes and sexual experimentation. The ultimate bad boy, Jim Morrison, encountered serious trouble when he got on the wrong side of Janis Joplin. According to Scars of Sweet Paradise by Alice Eccles, their relationship started with a hefty dose of animal magnetism. Joplin's friend Linda Gravenitis recalled that in the fall of 1967, Joplin and Morrison hooked up after dinner out with their bands and significant others, but the swinging indiscretion led to hate rather than love. During a subsequent meeting at a party, Morrison and Joplin got into a violent altercation. According to On the Road with Janis Joplin, eyewitnesses later agreed that Morrison started the trouble by insulting her during a game of pool. Actor Howard Hessman claimed Morrison got physical, grabbing her hair and smashing her face into a table. Whatever the case, she left the room crying only to return with a bottle of booze. Without hesitation, she brought the bottle crashing into the door's front man's head. Accounts varied as to whether she threw it or kept it in her hand. Either way, she knocked him unconscious. In her book Buried Alive, the biography of Janis Joplin, Joplin's publicist Myra Friedman claimed Joplin boasted enthusiastically about clocking Morrison. Besides her Bessie Smith idolatry, Janis Joplin also devoured information about the lives of other blues greats like Billie Holiday. Love Janice suggests that Joplin may have consciously or unconsciously patterned her life after Holiday's hard drinking, hard living ways. Holiday famously died at just 44 years of age from side effects caused by cirrhosis of the liver. Smith and Holiday weren't her only blues influences, though. According to Buried Alive, the biography of Janice Joplin, Grant Lyons introduced Joplin to Lead Belly, 
Though she reportedly wasn't a big fan at first, the influence is clear, with the New York Free Press declaring Joplin the voice of a lady lead belly. Before her musical career, Janis Joplin faced ridicule in her home state of Texas. Pearl, the obsessions and passions of Janis Joplin, argues that Janis Joplin's life changed dramatically during the teenage years. Not only did she end up at odds with her parents, but her freewheeling ways and obsession with art didn't win her many friends at school. Coupled with physical changes, she had trouble conforming. A childhood friend, Charlie Williams, described Joplin's awkward entrance to Thomas Jefferson High School. She'd been cute, and all of a sudden, she was ugly. It was like her total self-respect had taken a broadside. A painful adolescence gave way to a graceless early adult experience. According to the Washington Post, while studying at the University of Texas at Austin with 20,000 other students, a fraternity had Joplin nominated for the ugliest man on campus. This sealed the deal when it came to moving to the West Coast, which proved excellent for the future psychedelic scene but it didn't lessen the pain and heartbreak she carried with her. Once on the Dick Cavett show, she had the following to say about her move from Texas. They laughed me out of class, out of town, and out of the state. As Joplin tried unsuccessfully to reconcile her stage persona with her hometown reputation, she created a new identity which she could use to express herself. She dubbed the wild public persona Pearl. According to On the Road with Janis Joplin, Joplin used her Pearl personality to appear outgoing and confident, and also to hide a deep reservoir of insecurity she'd nursed since early childhood. Just seven weeks before she died, Joplin attended her 10th high school reunion in Port Arthur, Texas, and some say she never recovered from the event. Robert Rauschenberg, a fellow Port Arthur local, later recounted that Joplin had competing needs, as she wanted approval, but also wanted to show up those who had bullied her by showing off her fame and fortune. She wanted to rub it in, and on the other hand, she wanted to be loved. But as he astutely points out, these objectives proved mutually exclusive, leaving her lonely and subsumed by old insecurities by the reunion's end. Janis Joplin got her first big break while singing with the Bay Area-based band Big Brother and the Holding Company. Although most people focus on Joplin's role in the group, Big Brother and the Holding Company proved well ahead of their time, even before hiring the lady singer who would eclipse them. They pioneered what the San Francisco Examiner refers to as the group's signature freak rock sound, attributed primarily to guitarist James Gurley. Their appearance at 1967's Monterey Pop Festival and release of the album Cheap Thrills in 1968 launched the group into the stratosphere of psychedelic fame. But according to Buried Alive, the biography of Janis Joplin, the album's original title was actually Sex, Dope, and Cheap Thrills, which Columbia Records found too hot to handle. Fortunately for the record label, Joplin and Big Brother and the Holding Company agreed to shorten the name of their breakout album to Cheap Thrills. Despite the name change, the album's success proved undeniable. It has since been voted one of the best classic rock albums in history by Rolling Stone and has been inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. Few musical events are more iconic than 1969's Woodstock concert. For those in attendance, Janis Joplin took the stage in the wee hours of the morning. Dressed head to toe in a tie-dyed velvet shirt and bell bottoms, Joplin proved one of the most enthusiastically anticipated performers of the three-day weekend. Yet some audience members felt let down when she made her appearance without Big Brother and the Holding Company. Instead, she performed backed by the Cosmic Blues Band, which she had joined after leaving Big Brother and the Holding Company in 1968. She left her breakout band at the bidding of record executives, hoping the change would steer her music in the R&B direction. Still, she gave fans at Woodstock at least some of what they wanted, playing a few favorites from the Cheap Thrills album, including Peace of My Heart. It was just time for each of us to start growing from another direction. Over the past few decades, tattoos have become an acceptable way to adorn both male and female bodies. But back in the mid-20th century, tattooed women were still employed by circuses and freak shows. Their bodily adornments represented a major taboo and were even illegal in certain parts of the country. The status quo believed etched images communicated loose morals and skin art on women wouldn't start going mainstream until the 1960s and 1970s. Even then, it remained primarily associated with counterculture figures such as Janis Joplin. Never one to let the court of public opinion sway her decisions, Joplin visited famed tattoo artist Lyle Tuttle in 1970 for a bit of ink, as reported by Inked Magazine. According to Love Janis, he decorated her outer wrist with a symbol that represented a celebration of accepting life. There's a great cat in San Francisco that does these named Lyle Tuttle, who's mm -hmm. got him all over his body. He's just gorgeous. 
She also had a miniature heart tattoo on her chest, which she referred to as, quote, just a little treat for the boys, like icing on the cake. Chaos broke out at a Janis Joplin concert in Tampa, Florida in 1969, when the spirited singer was arrested for two counts of vulgar and indecent language directed at police trying to control the crowd. Joplin ended up booked at the police station just after midnight the following morning. A reporter with the Tampa Tribune would later relate that the police officers at Joplin's dressing room violated her constitutional rights by preventing her from making a statement. Later after arriving at the jail, she finally got to make a cheeky comment. As quoted in Pearl, The Obsessions and Passions of Janis Joplin, she stated, If I have to sit in jail, I would like it to be with the Rolling Stones. Unfortunately, Mick Jagger and the rest of the boys never showed up. After her untimely death in early October 1970, Janis Joplin's body was cremated at the Westwood Village Mortuary in Southern California. Following a private funeral with an intimate circle that included her parents and aunt on October 7th, an airplane took off over the Pacific coast near Marin County to scatter her ashes. Public reactions to her untimely passing varied greatly. For example, in her hometown of Port Arthur, Texas, the local newspaper featured an obituary emphasizing the fact that she never performed in her hometown and didn't visit very often. Others saw her death as a cautionary tale, and a significant drop in heroin usage happened. The timing of her demise just 16 days after that of Jimi Hendrix also inspired some fans and members of the media to connect the two tragedies. The fact the performers were rumored to be romantically linked only served to underscore the association. An editorial in the New York Times read, The king and the queen of the gloriously self-expressive music that came surging out of the late 60s are dead. The victims, directly or indirectly, are the very real physical excesses that were part of the world that surrounded them. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite musicians are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.